just because you have an instrument that costs you, I don't know, a few grand, uh, doesn't mean that you can't take a gouge to it and customize it so that it is a better tool for you as a musician. Obviously, don't do this to a 59 Les Paul. Should go without saying. So what I have got here is an Ibanez uh, sound gear by Ibanez Prestige four string bass. And uh, the client consistently smacks the top of the, the, uh, the beautiful carved wenge top of this bass while playing. And that noise is getting annoying. And well, they want me to carve it away. So customize away. Yo. Wow. Okay. That's loose. Always check your nuts, people. Uh, one of the first things I look for if somebody's saying, hey, I've got buzz, is has your headstock shrunk? Has the vibration moved uh, that thing? And are the nuts holding your tuners in place? Yeah, screws, everything. That's all, that's an absolute, that's an absolute no-no. This one's just spinning in the hole. It's just eaten the, uh, <laughs> it's just eaten the wango. So let's just fix that quickly, shall we? So that's now centered. I love me a good adjustable spanner. Bad ones, hmm. nice ones, pretty awesome. Now on to the actual repair. Let's see how long of a wire we've got on here. Uh, also, actually, before I do anything, I want to measure the height so that I can set it back to what the, uh, the client wants. There we go, so that's uh, seven and a half millimeters on that side. Obviously, Crimson Guitar string action gauge, metric an inch. Uh, we sell all sorts of stuff, check it out. The other side is also, well, uh, no. Seven. But Ben, use, a, use a, a, a depth gauge or a vernier caliper or something. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't be able to advertise the fact that we make our own Luthiers tools and, and yeah, they're fantastic. And second of all, uh, I don't actually know where my vernier gauge is right now. <laughs> yeah. Not a chance. Not a chance. I like the fact that these are machine screws going into threaded inserts. That's always cool to see. I might have enough room to push that pickup wire back through. That's a nice length of wire, don't you think? Oh, yes. Ha! Hashtag winning. My gosh, I feel so old and uncool. Essentially, this is the shape we're going for. This is the area we want to remove material. And uh, while I could obviously use a power tool to do this, I am also, as equally obviously, not gonna. At least to start with, I'm gonna use a, a carving gouge, just a big old gouge. It allows me to get the shape I need. It allows me to cut across the grain, etc., and set it. And we'll then sand it and do all of that noisy stuff. I've got a bolt <laughs> coming up under there, and I've got another one coming up under there. Uh, I suppose I need to take the uh, neck out to see how deep that is. There you go, very precise depth stop. Uh, I've got about four millimeters that I can cut into. I'm also, while I'm here, just going to draw on where the holes are. All good. Now, back together because uh, I need to know, well, I need to carve the whole thing in one piece, don't I? 
All right then, so I'm gonna be using a, a gouge because, well, because I wanted to. I'm cutting directly across the grain, so I've made this uh, very sharp. It's hard wood, so I'm going to be smacking it probably with a, uh, with a mallet, and, and that gives you a lot more control. If you are pushing with your hand, you can't stop. If you've got short, sharp blows, uh, you're stopping every two or three millimeters, depending on how much willy you're giving it. So we're gonna do that. And cutting across the grain also means that I am not running the risk of hitting a soft patch and just shearing off a load of material. Uh, when you watch a, a violin maker carve a violin top, something like that, uh, you go across the grain for most of the work. And right at the end, once you've got the shape where you need it, then you start scraping and finessing and going all over the place. Yeah. That works quite nicely. Mallet. Uh, this is by BC Woodworks, one of my, uh, my favourite makers. And you see the stop start motion. I've got I've got total control here. I am literally taking a gouge to somebody's dream bass guitar. All in order to make it somebody else's absolute dream bass guitar. So yeah, it's fine. Argue, fight, fight me in the comments. It's a little bit slippery uh, with the masking tape. Once you're through the masking tape though, it's perfectly fine. The tool is actually quite sharp, but it needs a stropping. In this case, this is one of the Crimson Guitars Luthiers fret strops. It's a little bit of leather on a leveling file handle. And I find for, specifically for gouges and things like this and knives, pushing the strop on the tool works better for me than pushing or pulling the tool on the strop. And you can do this a number of times before you need to go back to uh, actually sh using sharpening stones, etc. Yep. One mirror's edge and well, a very, very, very sharp gouge. Oh, yeah, that's a bit better. So did you see, I started that cut there, it slipped and I ended up there because I was doing the opposite of what I said and using hand power rather than a mallet. So up here, it's just a, it's just to continue the line to make it look like this base was designed to have this shape. Now I'm holding onto the bottom of the horn here and I'm pushing with my hand the gouge and keeping full control over it at this point. I'm not just pushing against the wood that I'm carving into. So I've got a little bit more control than if I was just doing this. So on your first pass through, you end up with these relatively large 
relatively deep uh, divots, uh, or at least valleys, uh, with with crests in between, and that is what we then need to go away and get rid of. Uh, but it is quite amazing how how uniform of a finish you can get with a gouge, uh, even a gouge with uh, this is probably a number five or a number six sweep. Uh, I've got much flatter gouges for finishing work, but uh, this is a, a perfect all well, general purpose uh, carving gouge. That's where my screw is there. So we've got a a curve going down into the uh, horn here. It's matched in the upper horn. In fact, it's much shallower in the upper horn. And essentially, I'm going to make it match the upper horn to a certain extent in feel. And at some point, I'm going to have to take the neck out. Well, maybe. This finger is whole is pulling the gouge down and back and giving me control. This little ridge here is annoying me. I think I'm gonna have to take that down. We'll see. Let's tidy up this edge first. Now, I probably wouldn't have been doing this in this way if this instrument didn't already have a scoop like this in the, uh, at the end of the neck, as it does. As it does, it gave me the perfect excuse. be a little bit of tidying up of that line during the uh, sanding process. There we go. Neck out. Tidy up that shape there. And we're done. Okay, there we go. So there's that. Uh, just don't like how tall that uh, lump is there. I don't like pushing against an open cavity just in case it shatters there, but I also have a nicely sharp chisel. So go down to the height I want at a slight angle. And it's not too dangerous. I'm now with the chisel rounding that edge over. To bring it closer to what's happening in the upper horn. And there we go. Almost. There's a little dip there. There's a little bit of tidying up to do. We've taken this uh, fairly standard base and absolutely customized it, made it into a more playable instrument for this client. Oh wait, I'm jumping the gun. There's still a bunch of sanding to do. But here it is. That's a 
relatively pleasing shape. It's in keeping with the instrument itself. It's in keeping with all the curves. I do need to just round, make that a little bit more round, looking at it through this camera. All right, on to, uh, onto the standing. I've done a little bit of shaping. I've done a little bit of tidying up, but uh, well, we need to get this thing done, don't we? In this case, scrapers, mini scrapers, micro scrapers, tiny little curved things, they are or were my friend. So just tidying up and normalizing the shape that I've got, the curves. Just get everything nice and even. And as much as possible, I'm going either at a 45 degree angle to the grain or, or with it. So here you can see a little bit of a dip where the, uh, where the curve is just a little bit uneven. Not going to take much to fix there. And this is not a very sharp scraper. I've, uh, <laughs> I've misplaced my burnisher. Can you believe it? Now check this out. We've got, as part of the conglomerate that is Crimson, uh, obviously, Guitar Building School, come and learn in person. Uh, Luthier's Toolworks making all of this cool stuff, but because I have no self-control, we also have VintageToolShop.com, and uh, I get first rights. The other day, we bought a tool collection, and this beautiful thing came in. It's a just a really old <laughs> sanding block, but it struck me that it might be useful. And here we are. Here is the beautiful thing, a chunky, chunky piece of cork. It's uh, fairly ergonomic, although a little bit smaller. And it means that I can wrap the paper around, which is probably a little bit coarse for what we're doing here, uh, but get right up to all the edges with, with total control over what I'm sanding. And uh, now really and truly, None of you need to watch this. You're watching this channel, you've seen sanding, you've probably done more than your fair share. So uh, the next stage is going to be going through the grits. This is, uh, I think, 120, 180, 240. Uh, probably going to stop at 240. And uh, I'll be back with you in a second with some oil. Okay, with that done, it is on to my favorite Crimson Guitars product. Currently, it changes depending on what job I'm doing. I'm gonna start with the penetrating guitar finishing oil and move on to high build. And we're sorted. Give it a good shake. <laughs> I love doing that. All right, tissue, nice, good, solid tool. And we don't want to put huge amounts on, but <laughs> look at that. So this is just soaking, soaking into the, uh, into the Wenge. Hmm. How do you pronounce uh, Wenge? <laughs> Let me know in the uh, comments. From this angle, it looks fantastic, but here it's a little bit of a flat, and I couldn't see it on this uh, on this bit of wenge. Uh, but now that I've got some finish on there and a little bit of shine, it's just a slight slight difference in the curve, slight difference in how it's uh, uh, in how it's reflecting. So I'm going to go back with my 320 and just to tidy that up a fraction. At what point? Uh, are we as guitar builders taking things too far? I mean, not at this point because it's got to be right, but, but still, where is that point? I just want to see what it's looking like now. 
Obviously, it's more matte than the surrounding finish, but uh, we'll build that up with the high build. Always, always, always put the lid on. If you don't, you knock it over. This is the initial few coats of penetrating oil. It's done its job, it's gone deep into the wood. I'm now gonna apply a couple of coats of high build guitar finishing oil, which is gonna start sitting on the top and that becomes a longer process. High build. And at this stage, you wanna build up a film. Uh, you wanna put enough on the instrument that it, so that it stays on the top. Of this on the surface and slowly slowly penetrates i'm going on fairly thick with it so talking about going on thick with it this is a product that you can buy that you should buy hell we should put it on sale or something um <laughs> i don't know uh yeah crimsonguitars.com check it out we do a lot of this sort of stuff and uh well it keeps the lights on and uh one of these people employed and these videos coming so we appreciate your support and also if you buy guitar fishing oil it implies you're buying guitars and that is after all the highest noblest um, use of your time i can imagine was that laying it on thick i think that was laying it on thick yeah let me know in the comments now at this point i've got a film developing you can see it's kind of stopped seeping into the uh, very open grained open poured uh, wood that this instrument has been made out of and uh, it's starting to build up the finish that we want yeah leave it to sit and at some point if you run your finger over it you're going to start to feel a little bit of resistance at that point it is supremely important that you pause your songs, you can say this important thing. It's incredibly important that you take a good clean bit of tissue and wipe away as much of the remaining oil on the surface. This is not a film finish. This stuff doesn't sit on, uh, on the top of the wood like a varnish would. It seeps into the wood. It, I don't know if it polymerizes. It probably isn't polymerizing. Whatever that means, let me know in the comments. <coughs> It doesn't build up in layers, it, it sinks into the wood, it hardens the wood, and you wipe the excess off. Uh, it's integral rather than external. Uh, if you leave it to sit externally, you end up with a sort of a gummy, messy kind of a thing. And, and this is not what this finish is designed to do. So, yeah, warm weather, it'll take 5-10 minutes. Cooler weather, yeah, well, longer than that. In fact, at some point, just if it's not... Uh, warm enough for that, then you might need to reconsider your workshop circumstances. Put the lid on, Ben. Mm -hmm. The finish there, it's just becoming tacky to the touch, kind of like my sense of humor. And you just got to rub that off until it's basically touch dry. You've almost, you've got a small sense of the fact that there was liquid on there. A, a, an inkling rather than a, hey, that's a little bit wet. And also these rags can catch fire. This is uh, the same rules as linseed oil, etc. Don't leave them bunched up in a bin. Uh, essentially, I'm not gonna make you watch me do any more of this. We're gonna build up three or four coats of uh, guitar finishing oil and go from there. Hey, Tom, should we? Uh, Put the guitar finishing oil on a limited on limited time sale for this video going up? Yes. Yes, there you go. Uh, Tom, Crimson's MD, you know him well, uh, agrees. These, if you want them, are going up for, well, we'll put them on sale, link in the description. Watch this face. Watch this face. Check I mean out. space. That there is what you just saw, a little bit of penetrating, a little bit of uh, high build, and that's actually a, uh, that's not a bad finish, is it? Nearly there. This little bit. This is a bit of a tutorial. Okay. With guitar finishing oil, if you want to get a glossy, a shiny satin finish, there is a trick as long as you don't have stain underneath. You can actually apply the oil 
using a fine wet and dry paper. And uh, well, I'm trying to match a particular gloss that's already on this guitar. So here I am after a few coats and uh, you can see in certain lights, well, I mean, it actually looks pretty much spot on. But uh, yeah, in real life, I'm not quite there. So I'm gonna take a section of 3000 grit, wet and dry, very fine. And I'm gonna use that to apply the oil. Ah, to apply, I'm gonna apply it with a rag, actually. This is still the Crimson Guitars high build oil. And once you've done that, it's just a simple process of buffing it in. And what this is doing is uh, not only uh, buffing the finish or polishing the finish as you go, it is also creating a microfine slurry uh, in the earlier stages that uh, can fill the grain. Obviously, as I go, I'm creating a little bit of friction and I am uh, warming up the oil and it's curing a lot faster as well, which is, uh, which is fine. You can apply a few coats and you could also, if you were doing this on an instrument that did not already have hardware, take this opportunity to just oil the whole top of the guitar and, uh, and blend it in that way you would end up with a thoroughly homogenous finish at that point. We're doing this on a bit of a budget this time. Yeah, a little bit of oil, and I'm just buffing it straight off. Let's get rid of that. The tissue also acts as a, a, a micro abrasive. You could use The micro abrasives of your choice, I suppose. I think we've got it. What do you think? Okay, now interestingly, at this stage, oh wow, that's not in focus. Is that on? That's on manual, my gosh. Uh, there we go. Uh, interestingly, at this stage, now that we've got everything that uh, we've asked for, yeah, there's a little bit I need to buff off there, actually. And uh, it's all looking lovely and perfect and, uh, and fine. Uh, the client's taken a look and said, actually, do you know what? We need a bit of a round over. So there's going to be a little bit of a do over. And I do think a round over. It illustrates the things, it illustrates what we're doing here perfectly, actually. The whole point is that we have an instrument that is exactly what the client requires, that does exactly what the client wants it to do. And uh, with a hard edge there, um, it does give an edge or something for fingers to catch on, etc. The whole point is to remove all of that. So there's going to be a little bit more carving, a little bit more refinishing, etc. And, uh, and that means that uh, you're going to have to go to, you're going to have to go to the Crimson Guitars Instagram, uh, at Crimson guitars, at Crimson Guitars, at Crimson Custom Guitars, I don't know, to check out the, uh, the final thing because, uh, well, it's going to be a whole lot more work and this video is finished at this point. You don't want to watch all of that and I kind of want to give you the satisfaction of seeing the finished thing uh, with strings on, etc. But that's going to take a little bit more time. So, yeah, if you are not yet following Crimson on Instagram, then please do. Hell, uh, at the real Ben Crow is my, my personal Instagram and... Uh, Stuff is starting to happen on there. Uh, we will be back in the comments below. Let me know. Hard line or soft line? Which would you go for? Thanks for watching. Click like, subscribe. Most importantly, get in your workshop. Make some sawdust. I know it's school holidays. I know you're probably on a beach somewhere. Find a workshop. Make something even if it is just sawdust and trouble.